you know when you kind of know enough about something that you can do it, yeah. but you're also completely useless? Yeah. That's where I come when it comes to cameras and audio and editing and everything. But you went hard on it because you were getting, I saw you like you got the same camera that I was looking at getting. Like a seven four. Yeah, so that's like the hybrid ones that just get yeah. photos as well. Yeah. Because you need photos for the thumbnail. Mm. Yeah. Dude, I spent so much time looking at YouTube reviews. <laughs> YouTube reviews, like that's... So you're a fan of Gerald Undone? Um, yeah, yeah, I know Gerald Undone. Yeah, I know him. There was another one. There was one video. It was between, I think, the A7 IV, the A something C. Mm. I think AC or something. And there's another camera. And I kept weighing up between those three. And I watched this one video because it had pros and cons for all of them. Mm. Eventually, I bit the bullet and got the A7. So is that is that? That's this guy right here. That's looking at you. It's, it. it gives you a beautiful shot. It's the quality. You'll see afterwards. You're like, this is the hybrid. Because I wanted to take photos and I wanted to do video, yeah. but I didn't want to do either like great. I just wanted to be like semi okay at them. So mm -hmm. that's where it ended up. All right, we're jumping in. Another episode of Track Experience with Ben Cathro. Now we're going to go back a bit because I'm going to say most people would probably know you for you coming back into racing like mm. a lot of people like new fans of the sport probably people that watch this would know you as like ben cathro like inside the tape yeah. and more stuff to do with like the pink bike team and everything mm -hmm. but i remember ben cathro is the extremely tall man that rode an orange in lycra at fort william that's my were you were you racing i wasn't racing but i were remember you... there was like some controversy because you were running a skin suit and no one else was running it and yeah. i remember you got interviewed and you're like i think you're like if the sponsors or whatever like want me to be in it I'm gonna be in it yeah is that what was the, the go with that I mean I was yeah tallest rider uh going with a lot of spine but I didn't really have much spine when it came to signing contracts <laughs> I was like well, you're gonna give me a free bike and I've got to wear a skin suit you all right <laughs> that was part of the deal you had to had to run yeah it. yeah definitely part of the contract and it was actually I think he wanted us to take the peaks off as well but it wasn't in the contract. The visors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. And he was like, if you're wearing a skin suit, you might as well take the visor off as well. And I was just like, no, 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 I can't do it. But yeah, that was that was the reason they fully banned it after that, because it was a gentleman's agreement before then. Mm. And then that's when the stretch rule and material rule came in, like the week after. Really? Yeah. Did you do a ride at that race? Because yeah. Fort William would be the one to wear a skin suit. Absolutely. It was actually insane how good it was. Um, in terms of just speed carrying was daft. Like you'd feel like places you'd normally pedal, you just didn't need to just cause you just slice through the air. And I got eighth with a really bad run cause I didn't practice in it cause I was too embarrassed. So I, <laughs> I was just overshooting turns, like coming in, missing breaking points and then like blowing out the tire and dabbing. And then just having, I came down, I was like, oh shit. And then got eighth. And you like, were a bit of surprise. Yeah, like super surprised. Did you cough some shit from other riders, even though you yeah. said like, it's in my contract, like I can't? Yeah, well, yeah, because I'm sure a lot of other riders were asked and they said no, but I was, uh, what, how old was I then? Like, what eight, was 18, 18 year old, 19 year old kid. And I was just like, stoked. Was this 2008, nine? Eight. Eight, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah coughed some shit. I went to shake Rennie's hand on the podium and he didn't even look at me, so. Oh, like, really yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's so funny how it's like i, I can kind of see why but at the yeah. same time it's like it you were kind of not not forced into it but it was part of the contract but then obviously it was faster yeah well i mean the sport was really confused back then i didn't really know what i wanted to do mm -hmm. and i'd say it's still kind of confused but <laughs> <laughs> Like if, if someone, if someone like this weekend wore like a shiny black ski suit down and like got a result they wouldn't normally have gotten, mm. I think people would be frosty still, Yeah, to be honest. But it's funny now, like you see people putting on jerseys and they're literally skin tight anyway. Yeah. Like you saw, Absolutely. I saw that, some... that slow-mo of Bruni from Ludenville and it was just like, like right in on his upper body and it's just like, you can see the... You can see the writing on his elbow pad pretty much. So yeah. It's just like... There's a video of someone helping him put his jersey on. Is there? Yeah, the, like that he shared. Like it wasn't like he's trying to hide it. Like it, we know it's tight. Well, dude, yeah, it's... We're trying to go fast. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. But then it's like at what point because you see someone like... Dude, I look at old videos of Sam Hill back in like 2009 mm. and he's wearing like a parachute. Mm. Like you see the old Troy Lee gear that was like baggy and the yeah, moto yeah. stuff and you're like... Fair play to you, but like you look mm. at the, the change where it's gone from that. I think, like you said, we were kind of confused because like we're not road cycling and we're not BMX, mm. like freestyle or supercross or whatever. So we're like, 
we're in that between road cycling and motocross. Yeah. And motocross was like real baggy and road cycling was really tight and mm. we kind of somehow have met in the middle now. Yeah. Well, we, we didn't really have an identity and we we're just borrowing from all the other ones and Mo was just the coolest one. So it's just like, yep, yeah, that, please. And then uh, people just kind of started pushing things further and further and further. And it's, you know, like we went 29 inch wheels and it's like, that looks terrible. Mm. That looks awful. Now you go back, it looks terrible. So we've gone tighter and tighter and tighter. And now I think baggy stuff when it comes to racing kind of looks a bit wrong, mm. you know? It just takes a while for opinions to kind of change and get used to stuff, so. I think now it's with, it's tighter, but it's not Lycra. No. Like it's a, it's, th- it's a pretty big difference. I think it looks good, honestly. Yeah, I'm, I agree. Yeah, I yeah. think it, I don't look at someone like, we say like Luke's running tight gear and like, oh, even my gear is like super tight mm. compared to what it used to be. Yeah. And we even ask for it. Like we ask, we, all our gear is tailor-made to our size mm. and we always ask like i run small gloves i yeah. run medium pants i run a medium jersey i haven't thought of going tighter with the gloves yet that's that's new on me. but they stretch because yeah, the true. i run fist gloves and they're quite stretchy yeah. so i go tighter but then after one like they're too tight when i put them on yeah but then they stretch to my hands you wear them for a day you literally i can't just i can't put a new pair of gloves on and Break go riding straight away i yeah, have yeah. to put them on and like move them around yeah. but then you get to the point like if i run medium gloves they'll stretch a bit and then they'll be not too big but for like personal pre- i glue my hand my gloves to my hands as well yeah what? i have like you know like a sports <laughs> spray like when you have like an injury and you got to tape your shoulder yeah. they'll put like a spray on your shoulder yeah. before they wrap the tape to make yeah. it extra sticky i spray that on my hands before my race run i've never and heard then of I that glue my gloves because you know when you get bunching in yeah. your gloves yeah, yeah it just takes away that you just literally in the palm a little bit on your fingers every, every run or just race runs just race call in okay. race yeah I've never heard you that. You should try it. It feels like, it honestly feels gloveless because you don't get that bunch. I hate the mm. bunching. I think mm. that's the issue I have because my gloves yep. towards the end of a run and your hands get tired. Yeah. You get that bunching and your hands move in your gloves. Glue them on. Interesting. Give it a go. Like, honestly, I feel like I've heard every single tip going. I'm kind of excited to try that. No, it's I, honestly, I, like for a race run, I, because I was obviously never wore gloves yeah. and I think Laurie turned me onto it because I think Laurie does it as well. Mm. I'm not sure if he still does. I know he used to. He turned me onto it because I had to wear gloves in France and whatever. So yeah. I tried it and I was like, oh, that's, that's perfect. See, I, I was the other way around. I tried to go gloveless. So mm. I went to New Zealand and did a season there and just everyone's doing it. It turns out I've got really sweaty hands. <laughs> I can't do it. I, I had such a bad crash because I was like doing a, I was doing a flow trail and pulled for a gap and just went shoom, and just lost like, it. And just came off I'm like, nah, I'm gloves for life, but maybe glued on. <laughs> Unpopular opinion, you know, people rub dirt on their hands and then hold the g- grips. Yeah. I don't think that makes it better. I think that makes it a lot worse. Like, huh. I guess if you've got sweaty hands, you kind yeah. of maybe get some of the sweat, but then I feel like you've just got mud. Now you've got mud on your hands. Interesting. I guess it depends. Depends on the mud, depends on how much you sweat. Because maybe, like, it's like talc, okay? That's the theory, isn't it? Yeah, it's supposed to, like, make it not as bad, but I don't know. I've not experimented. <laughs> gloves. <laughs> Test it out. We'll glue, we'll, glue, we'll glue some gloves on, though. Um, but I was going to ask, going back to when you're obviously racing back in, because when was when was the first year you started racing downhill competitively? Mm, Did you do like you, regionals? You mean? Well, or oh. World Cup, well regional, but to, we'll start regional and then go World Cup. Uh, regionals was 2000. I think that's the year I turned 12, and that's when you're allowed to race. Mm. Um, and I, yeah, pretty much raced all the Scottish races since then. Went to nationals i was the same as brendan so it was just like trying to chase him and like didn't catch him very often <laughs> like brendan was absolutely unreal as a junior like getting podium times at world cups and stuff mm. it was like insane so yeah i was just chasing him as a kid and then got to world cups uh when so the year you turned 17 so um and back then there was no junior race it was just it was it, everyone was elite you just going with everyone i went to a race in villingen in germany was there a flat one real flat yeah another one real yeah. flat and they built like f- massive jumps <laughs> like that was like the first world cup where it was like f- like huge jumps like uh just I think random ten, man-made rock gardens as well is that the yeah, one? yeah 10 people i think did the big gap out of everyone that was there <laughs> And I, I remember I spent like half of practice just doing run-ins at it, like <laughs> psyching yourself up, like we're gonna do it. Yeah, we're yeah, gonna, yeah. This is the one. I was like, but it was like really tricky because you had to get the timing on a few jumps coming in mm. just right, um, and be in the right gear and get all the pedals done for it. And then remember they had hay bales as like the 
crash matting. Mm. And I was like, that's going to hurt like hell if I land on those. Like, absolutely savage. <laughs> um, and yeah, there just as a kid, first World Cup, I've only ridden muddy, like, kind of tight tracks in the you trees. You have ridden big jams? No, I don't know, like barely. Um, but I, f I loved it. It was like such an experience seeing all like the, like I think everyone that comes to the World Cups has this where they're just like, That's, like that guy's like Steve Pete. Or yeah. It's like, oh my God, it's Nathan Rennie. Like, holy shit. And it's like, I'm going to follow him. <laughs> and like dropping behind him, gone. Amazing. <laughs> like, Did that work though? Experience. Did you like say to like, not tow you in, but you kind of got towed in by them, but just... Well, no, I just dropped. Like, I'd be waiting... That's what I mean, you're going, going behind <laughs> yeah, them. Yeah, I'd be waiting to say the track, and be like, oh, there he is, and, like, get ready, and, like, drop in behind them. And, like, you've got no momentum. They're already gone. Yeah. But, yeah, just, like... It's weird, that's, it. that star, like... I know when I first came to World Cups, you kind of... You're more in awe. Mm. Like, it's hard to focus on your riding because yeah. there's the guy. Like, and, like, for me, I was so nervous, like... Everyone, it feels like everyone's watching you yeah, and no like, cares. Judge, like judging you. It's like they're going to think I don't belong here. Mm. Um, and yeah, oh, but it was super cool. And actually talking about people I was looking up to, like one of the things that stood out to me that is like a solid memory from that race is the amount of power Chris Kovarik had back then because there was a really long tabletop. No one could clear it uh, like clean. And he was on flat pedals, just came in, just was like, barely looked like he was trying, and then just like scrubbed it under a huge whip. I was like, fine. That is absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> like, how has he done this? Well, he's got calves that are like yeah. 12 inches wide. Like, he's, yeah, he yeah. was the guy back then as well. Yeah. Hey? Oh, it was so cool. Um, so, yeah, that was first World Cup. Um, how long did it take yeah. you racing? Because you, you obviously came in and you would have had speed, like, you would have been there with Brendan and whatever, so you were mm. fast enough to be there. But how long did it take you? to feel like you belonged in racing World Cups? Was it like a slow process or did you have some, because you said the year after at Fort William you got eighth. So it uh, feels like, a, or the year, two years after. Two years after. Two yeah. years after. So it, it seems like that's a pretty quick progression mm. to go from like, I don't belong here to, okay, I'm, I can be the guy um, or one of the guys. Um, like the way I am as a person, I, I feel like I'm always extremely self conscious about how people view me and everything and I think I was always worrying about how I kind of fit into the World Cup and to be honest I never really felt like I belonged like I never felt like I've made it I'm here I deserve to be here if that makes sense I was always quite like I'd get a good result and be having like a good time enjoying riding my bike and everything but I never really felt like I don't know that was it and I was safe and it was like my job or anything like that. Cause I, I mean, I never got to a point where I ever got paid to ride my bike. It was, I'd work in the winter and then uh, spend all my money in the summer racing. So no, I'd never got to that point. Like I didn't feel at home until I started doing the videos to be honest. Really? Yeah, genuinely. So how many years did you actually race in that mindset of like, I'm working in winter to race in summer and I'm gonna do this thing, but it's not Two my thing. 2006 until 2012 so, so I think it was six years yeah. of like working away at it and got some really good results like maybe about seven or eight top 20s and about three top two top 10s um, and like 14th at Schladming so like good results but back then it was there was no or not much social media and stuff like that and I was quiet I didn't talk to anyone I pretty much would turn up keep to myself, ride my bike, get a good result, go home. And then I wouldn't get in the magazines, I wouldn't really get in the videos, and I wouldn't get sponsorship because of that. And I didn't know how to do it, and I didn't know how to approach people and make things happen. Um, so yeah, it was like, it never felt like I belonged, but I really enjoyed racing my bike, so I made it happen, mm. you know? It's, uh, it's, yeah. it's crazy like the stories like that like even for example like Flo Payette mm. he raced for 19 seasons or 19 mm. years and he said like the same he wasn't even paid for a, a large chunk of that mm. career until he like obviously had breakout results yeah. where he got on world champs podiums and yeah. had that deal but he just said like, I just love racing my bike yeah. and he'd go home and work in the winter and then yeah. come race in the summer and that lifestyle was something he wanted to do but mm. it's yeah it's just it's interesting you say that that is that a reason you think that 
well, a factor why you stopped racing because it was like, well, I'm not getting money for it and I don't feel like this is 100% my place? Yeah, I mean, I was getting to, well, not even getting to an age that you're supposed to <laughs> start earning a living or anything, but you kind of feel that societal sort of pressure that, like, I have no savings, I have no prospects, like, it feels like the racing could happen, but it might not happen, and you kind of have to sit down and go, what am I going to do? And then I did the classic thing, which is started coaching, started a, started a coaching company, and then kind of did that, but I kept racing at home, like, I was actually really enjoyed it, in that everyone would go away and and race World Cups, and then they'd all come home and like race in the UK, and then I'd go and try and beat them all. <laughs> and that was like my that is proving sa yourself my kind of satisfaction. Thing. It's like they're coming home to chill, have a fun race, and I'm there like, let's go. Going <laughs> in. Do you think the coaching and stuff made you, because you said you were quite a quiet person, do you think that kind of brought you out of your shell in a way and made you more like, because you're obviously your personality I, now is someone that you wouldn't say is shy and to themselves. I, I, I have to, even now, I still have to really force it. Like, even like doing like this kind of thing, like I still get really apprehensive beforehand, but I've learned to like mask it and kind of have cope with it quite yeah. well. Um, but this is not my natural, I don't know, doesn't feel like my natural kind of habitat. Do you, think, do you think a part of it is, because I, I heard this thing, it's like a lot of the things we strive for as adults is something like a trauma or an issue we had as a child. Mm -hmm. And I know, like I've openly talked about this, but like I was terrified of public speaking as a kid. Mm -hmm. And I guess this is a form of public speaking. Yeah, yeah like there's no people behind there, but like 20,000 people might watch this. Like yeah. that's, people are watching you. And I just know I wanted to beat that. I yeah. wanted to like beat that for myself. And it was something that I feel like if you were quiet and now mm. you can be this out there person that's proving yourself like you can. For, for me, it's the, like, you have your own image of yourself and you want to portray like that image to other people but I think I care so much that I really struggle. Like I feel like my thoughts get stuck in my head when I'm trying to like be like someone that can hold like good conversations, be interesting and be like, uh, you know, someone that someone would like. Um, I, uh, I really struggle to do that face to face um, unless there's like easy stuff to kind of talk about like bikes and stuff like that. I find talking about bikes is just easy, but like general chit chat I really struggle with. And then I found cameras it's almost like a safety net between the person so I can be myself and know that if I mess it up it's I can just edit it it doesn't matter yeah <laughs> yeah like it's and, and then, then it's funny yeah. though because a lot of time messing it up like that's your genuine self and people actually want yeah. to like that's the whole idea of like why vlogs are so popular yeah because it's not edited it's like it, it's raw I, I guess it's the not having the immediate potential judgment there yeah if that makes sense yeah I get so it's saying. like you don't have to like worry about a reaction to what's like, what's happening. You can just make the mistake and be it's, it's funny, and then you can edit it, put it up, show your mistakes if you want to. If there's something that you've maybe said, something that I don't know in the moment you think might offend people, you can be like, um, maybe I'll hide that. Yeah, you can <laughs> second kind of, kind of second guess yeah. yourself yeah, in yeah, a way, yeah. but in a good way sometimes it could be a positive. Just be like, oh, okay, yeah. maybe we won't put that out. Are we? Yeah. Do you could you see yourself doing something like commentating or something? Because I guess that's like straight to the. So, that's that's where it comes across you can you so, are like on show yeah so this is something that's been brought up a lot online like i get it in the comments a lot and like oh yo get catherine in the booth that'd be sick would not be sick i don't think I, I, do I having a good I, I don't know like i really struggle with like work not working with other people but like um having a good kind of to and fro between someone when it's live i like i i think i would be too apprehensive you need chemistry I, with the person as yeah well. like you need to feed off what the other person's exactly. doing i i feel like if i was in the booth by myself i'm just commentating on what i saw i think i'd probably be do quite a good job of it but actually trying to work with someone to kind of create like a whole mm. I, I don't know i've never been that good at working with people I really struggle with it um, because what what happens quite a lot is I get hyper focused into things and then I struggle to see everything else that's going on around me and like managing the people around me and that kind of stuff mm. it's yeah I I don't think I'd be good live 
but I know I can make some of the best stuff like if if I'm given the time to plan it and like like even right now like trying to think of how to say what's in my head I really struggle yeah um, but if I have time to think about it and then write it out and like yeah yeah, yeah and then like really let my thoughts form yeah. I feel like my thoughts don't operate at the pace of normal com conversation yeah I get what you're saying yeah, yeah you kind of need the, the time to actually like see yeah. it reflect on it understand yeah. it and then put it out there yeah. which it's funny you say because I'm probably the opposite I'm more like how I feel in the moment I think yeah. is the best thing if I try and fine tune it mm. I feel like I just make mistakes and go around in circles yeah. so it's, it's how people operate it's different yeah. different things and like it's for the commentary like I don't think I would be that good at mm. doing that either mm -hmm. but that's just like it's just not your thing mm -hmm. like for example like what did you think of Aaron Gwynn um, in the commentary booth for okay. Ludon Vial he was so good yeah like I would put him and uh, like in the booth for like all of them like if I could like mm. Uh, his insight, the way he was able, like, I think when, when you're commentating, I'm guessing either the screens are terrible or it must be really hard to actually see what's going on when you're trying to think of what you're saying because I feel like they miss stuff all the time. Mm. And then Aaron seemed to spot everything. So, like, when uh, An was it Antoine Vidal crashed, and they were like, whoa, and then just shouting, like, what happened, what happened? And he was like, he blew his hand off. I think he blew his hand off because his rear triangle hit the tree. And they're mm. like, what, what, what? Like, yeah. not knowing what he's on about. And they looked and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, that is what happened. And I think being able to spot that and you almost have to have like a framework of experience to be able to like spot those possible answers to what's happened. Mm. Like I feel like potentially Rick maybe doesn't have as much experience with racing and those things to kind of pool knowledge from. And then Gracia, because he's trying to do it in a different language, and he's probably having to think real hard about what he's saying. He's maybe not seeing mm. everything. But yeah, I was just like, Aaron said so many things. I was like, yes, yeah, that's bang on, and like good insights as well. It was cool. I thought I thought he did really well. I thought I thought so as well. I just think the one of the biggest thing is the fact that he's like he's so in the sport still mm. so he knows everyone yeah. so well yeah. and he knows all the little things that are happening and all the big things and everything and he like one of the things that I always did like about and I don't want to like preach on about like I'll oh, bring Rob and Elliot and whatever back because mm. whatever's happened has happened but mm. they would come around the pits and yeah. talk to the athletes yeah. and I was like that's that's your training yeah. that's putting the reps in mm. so then when you get on track and Elliot's come up to me and I've said oh I've just moved in the off season I'm living in this new place like yeah. the riding's like this yeah you've got your information that yeah. you can put out. And I think that's something that I just think those guys need to do more of. Like, I just don't really see them around the pits talking mm. with athletes. And I'm like, they, they might, I don't know if they haven't mm -hmm. talked to me and they haven't talked to the people on my team. But I think that's mm. the biggest takeaway is just like, just, just feed yourself with more information about mm. the athletes that you're commentating on. And I think that's the, the biggest thing because yeah. people want a story behind an athlete. And that's something that I think our sport could do so much better at. Like mm -hmm. you look at, I, for example, for motocross, I used to watch this show called, um, or this series called, I think it was called, it's called MX Nation now, but it used to call be called um, Moto Inside the Outdoors. Yeah, I and remember that. You watch it's that? So good. And they would follow these kids around since like Loretta Lynn's yeah. up until their pro career. And yeah. they'd have all this old footage and they'd yeah. have like stories. And, have, and it was just like, you built a relationship with this person through mm -hmm. these stories and you've seen their whole childhood of racing up until now. It's mm -hmm. like, you know them so well mm -hmm. so you're invested in them and i think mm -hmm. for our sport we don't like like we wear helmets you don't even see our face like we need stories of who we are and not just that these robotic people that throw themselves throw themselves down the hill mm -hmm. we need their personality who they are what they do and i think that's something that you've been doing more of is like giving people that information through like talking to more people and actually understanding who they are yeah do you yeah. find like that's something you've been able to do as well being part of it as well like you obviously still race and you're in it do you reckon that gives people a lot more comfortability around you i think so i think f for me personally like i feel like my the relationships that i kind of developed kind of over the years is quite narrow like i i, I didn't like try and put myself out there and kind of like meet everyone and like get to know everyone because it just made me so nervous to even thinking of it talking with loads of different people but i do feel like being in it is super important like you can't talk about a sport unless you know the people, you know what 
is going on in their lives, you know, like, oh yeah, he's just like, had really, I don't know, his house burnt down or some shit like that, you know, like, you actually have some uh, background. Do you wanna, does it matter? Sorry, you looked at the van and I was like, I was, oh. just trying, I was like, it'd be loud, loud or not, but it'd be fine. <laughs> <laughs> you get a little background noise. It's yeah. off track experience, we go off track, we go, we go remote places. Yeah, right. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, band noise. and you're bang on with like Elliot and Rob, they put in so much work. Mm. Like, and I think a lot of people didn't realize that. It was just like, oh yeah, Elliot knows bikes because he used to race and Rob's loud and funny, so that's good. But Rob would be there way before the broadcast started, doing all his prep work, learning like all the kind of what was happening in the day, talking with all the people. And uh, yeah, it meant that he was really good, like really, really good at it. So yeah, that's definitely, if you're gonna follow on from that, then you at least have to emulate. And uh, I've, I've seen Rick cutting about chatting with people, so he does do that. Um, but yeah, it's, yeah, you gotta know the sport, you gotta know the people. Mm. Yeah. Do you find as well, like I said before, we need more stories in the sport? Like how important do you find that is in any, like not just downhill but any sport like having backstories mm. for, to show where someone's come from and what they've done i think from my perspective being like wedge right in the middle of it it's maybe i don't see as much value in that it's like i almost need to remove myself from the sport or even imagine that i'm following another one like that i have no idea about i feel like there would be a big benefit because like you can't like be a fan unless you know the person, I guess. You, know, you can be a fan of someone's riding, I guess. You'd be like, oh yeah, that looks sick, he does nice whips, all that kind of stuff. But to really be like invested in a person, you do have to know them. And we see that with like, you doing your stuff and people get to know you a lot better. Uh, people doing vlogs and stuff like that. It's insane how, like, uh, have you seen Tiwo and our team start doing a vlog? Mm. There's just people that are just like, absolutely just, super fans of Tebow now that are coming around and saying like, dude, like we love your videos. It's so cool that you're doing it in French because like my family doesn't speak good English and all the videos are in English and it's like, it's so good. And it's like, these are people that might have been like, oh yeah, he's all right. But now they know him, mm. huge fan. They want to see him do well. They want to see what, what's going on, what he's up to. It's, yeah. It increases it's, your value mass. Like it almost, we yeah. were talking about this with um, Matt Walker and Eddie and we were saying how it turns fans into friends. Yeah. in their head anyway which then if they open up to you as a friend then you're more willing to mm. give back as well if someone comes up to you and kind of stands 10 meters away and takes a photo of you it's like yeah. you can't really have a connection with them but if they yeah. come up to you and like reference something that yeah. has to do with your life you're like oh we can actually yeah we can go into this and that like, i remember realizing that was the secret when i was doing like the vlogs and videos and the catheter vision and stuff is like you talk to the camera like it's your mate mm. just tell them what's going on and then the person at home feels like they're your friend mm. and it is yeah it's super valuable although sometimes it can be a bit weird when people talk, just go rock up and be like yo how's it going yeah. like yo like, who are you yeah it was like i've had that just in the supermarket at home just like a random it was like a spanish guy that was on holiday in the town that i happened to live in and he just came up and started chatting with me and i was like cool like do I, do I know you or anything? Because like it's a little supermarket yeah, it's tiny, village. Yeah. And uh, he was like, oh no, I'm just a fan. I was like, cool. Like that's meant like. Does it still weird you out when like people know who you are? They met, like even, I get weirded out when photographers know who I am still. Yeah. Like sometimes I see a photographer, which I don't know. And they'd yeah. be like, oh, can you like move out of the shot, Dean? And I was like, oh, you know who I am. Yeah. Like that's still <laughs> weird to me. We're at a World Cup and I'm like racing my bike. Like it trips me out. I find it so, I feel like it's the oddest, like weirdest thing to people. And mm. it's funny because we put so much of ourselves on the internet. So yeah. people say it, but I never want to feel like people should know who I am. I feel like that's just the slippery slope down your own ego getting too big. So it's like, it's, oh, then you've got like conflicting things then in your head. Cause that's a tricky thing. Yeah. You don't want it to be all about ego and stuff, but you have to do it to build your profile cause it's has value. So it's like well, it's the whole idea of being an athlete, man. Yeah. It's this double-edged sword of yeah. you've got to think you're the man mm. and you're going to be the world champion or you're the guy and blah, blah, blah. Mm. But you also have to like, you have to stay humble enough to be like, I'm not better than anyone else kind of thing. Mm. And it's hard, especially I heard this thing, Shia LaBeouf talks about like athletes and actors being really similar where it's like mm. you're so self-centered in like your success being the only thing that matters. Mm. And 
it's like a destructive mindset in the way that like no one else seems as, as important as your goals. Yeah. And that's something that I feel like is a hard thing to manage. And that's, that's a very kind of relevant topic for me because this is what I've been discovering like in these last couple of years when I sort of tried to make the, the big return, <laughs> you know? And I was like, right, well, how do I do it? How do I come back stronger and better? And it was trying to prioritize all the things I needed to do. And I realized I couldn't. That was like my big kind of like epiphany. I was just like, right, I've made time so I can train. There are all these other tasks, but I need to train. But then I would do the other tasks. Mm. I just couldn't prioritize me and my training. And I was like, well, that just tells me that it's not my priority. Um, so like it's not been said yet but i'm not going to go full world cup season next year because there's a, a lot of other things in my life that are my priority and i'm also better at so like for me world cups will be always something i'll probably be involved with i may race some more in the future but not where do you find with those different things that you do where do you find the most fulfillment It's different from fulfillment from different things. So, the f like, got a couple of kids at home now. So, like, trying to make it so that I can actually do stuff with them, like, go out and bike rides, like, take take them out on rides and like, do stuff with them and see them like learning new stuff, like, trying to get Jack to actually learn to actually push with his feet and then take his feet off the ground and coast along on like the little scoot bike, and he's almost got it. And then when he gets that, that's going to be sick. Um, and then uh, daughter Evie is just learning to walk. And she's so stubborn. She won't do it when people are watching. But we've caught her doing it, like, out in the garden. It's like, she's walking. She'll see us and then sit down. She's like, no, <laughs> like, come on. You can do it. It's like, no, no. Doesn't want to do it. So that kind of stuff, like, you, yeah. There's, it's, it's hardwired into our genes to just be, like, stoked on kids and family like super cool but then the big thing for me is making videos that I am just like yes we've absolutely nailed exactly what we want to do like the concept the planning the delivery it's entertaining it's got like really good information and people love it I'm just like oh. like that for me is amazing I love it um but when I've had a good race and done like a sick run and won, that is still the best feeling I think I've ever had. Mm. I don't think that can really be top where you're just like, I'm the best fucking person here. Like mm. no one could have touched that kind of thing. That it's a, it's a powerful drug for sure. Um, but it's so fleeting and then it's gone and it doesn't sustain you. It's just like, you know, it's not something that can be chased forever, if that makes sense. Mm. Whereas uh, it's like, we've only just been kind of researching it recently. It's like the difference, I think it's probably obvious to a lot of people, but the difference between dopamine and serotonin, like dopamine's like your instant, like gratification, like meant, and it just disappears. And then your serotonin is the thing for kind of prolonged happiness. I feel like <laughs> racing's dopamine and then all these other things like are must be serotonin. I might be totally wrong, but that's the kind of way I've got it pictured in my head. I get what you're saying. It's also the mm. amount of effort you have to put in to make that race run that thing. Yeah. And that's the thing that you come back to. So in your head, it's like, I'm going to give up going to be with my kids and helping them on training wheels because I'm going for an XC ride for two hours because I want to get that feeling in the race. Yeah. And then it's like, all right, I'm pulling something away from here to put it into here. Mm. But then that doesn't give me the same fulfillment as helping seeing my kid on training wheels. And I guess that's when you ha find the, okay, like I'm doing this more. So this is obviously more, like mm. this is more important than, than this. Mm -hmm. And that's the, I guess the balance that we've all got to come up with. Cause it's like, as soon as you do put effort into something, you take out energy into something else. Yeah. And that's the thing, it's like, you only, you know yourself better than anyone. Like, where do I want to put that into? Mm. And where do I get the most out of doing that? Mm. So I guess for you, it's like that racing feeling. Cause I know that the thing is like, when you are 
winning or not even winning, but just having those runs where everything is mm. turned off and you'll feel like the man, mm. like that's hard to beat mm. no matter what. Mm. But then the effort you have to put in to create that yeah. becomes hard to balance with, yeah. with everything else. Yeah, there's not, <laughs> it doesn't actually <laughs> weigh up when you look at everything that's gone into it and then what you get yeah. out of it. But it is quite nice. <laughs> yeah. Because I was talking to um, Loic a little while ago about the amount of times that he reckons he's been so in the flow state of mm. everything was shut off and he's like, I can't not win. I can't, like, I'm, like, no one can beat me right now. But I'm not even thinking about if anyone can beat me. I'm just, mm. I'm just doing the thing that mm. I know I can do. And I think he said he, less than 10 times mm. he's felt that. Mm -hmm. and he's what seven to six time world champion yeah. and he's won more world cups and yeah. in that career of i think he's been racing the same as me or maybe year, like 11 12 years mm -hmm. so in that 12 years less than 10 times he's felt that feeling mm -hmm. but i guarantee that he'd probably do it all over again to try and yeah. find that feeling and i was gonna yeah. ask how many times do you reckon you've been in that state of not, like it's like it's like time altering it's like you're not you're not uh, I, I feel like there has been a few, but the only one I can like remember was uh, it was a race at Fort William because I, I just remember being in the finish area and I was like, I cannot remember my run. <laughs> like, I genuinely can't remember. Like, and it wasn't like a, <laughs> but you could say, oh you, yeah, he probably concussed himself like <laughs> morning practice or something. It wasn't, it was just like really good run. I think, I don't even remember the race. I just remember, specifically remember being at the bottom of the run and being like, can't remember that i'm pretty sure i won it um but yeah so for me it's less less than 10 times a lot less than 10 times um and i wonder if some people are better at getting into that flow state or if it like there's a certain amount of work that you put in that will make it more likely to happen if it's something you can train it's a super interesting thing i think it's a combination of like a million different things but it's mm. the whole like confidence has got to be involved in it preparation like which obviously feeds into confidence fitness like all of these different elements mm. and then your overall like life as well like mm. if your family's good if you and your girlfriend are good if you mm. and your kid like if everything is firing on all cylinders mm. i think it creates this peace in your mind mm. that just shuts off because it's just like you just your head noise just gets turned off yeah it's just like there's no I should have braked more, I should have, whatever I need to, like, it's just, you just, it's autopilot. Yeah. And you're just, I think that's what people like um, monks and stuff meditate for years. And mm. I think that's where they get to when there's nothing. Yeah. But I guess for us, we need the active stimulus of racing to mm -hmm. create it, but it's still hard to, to create oh, that feeling. It is super, super hard. And um, yeah, like you can find it in other things. Like I find when I'm like, building a wheel mm. or something like that i find i can get into that flow state where i'm just not thinking about things but i think you're at speaking like talking like doing a video of being yeah. in like that flow state of just like the right like you're not even thinking about what to say but you're saying exactly what you want yeah i don't think i felt that you ever felt that before <laughs> i'm constantly thinking about what to say i've either got a script which i'm just reading off and i actually find that really hard to do like i struggled to read at speed and not like fumble my words and then if I'm like delivering a video, maybe if it's something I'm really knowledgeable about, yeah, probably like just get into the flow. Or maybe actually, you know what, when I'm like coaching people and it's just like giving them feedback on what's going on and I'm like uh, doing that kind of stuff, I feel like I don't really need to think. I can just see what's going on and just explain it to them. Mm. Maybe a little bit then as well. But yeah. It's a good feeling though, isn't it? Yeah. When it's just, just happens from years of experience and yeah. whatever and it's just like oh i don't even know where i'm pulling this from and yeah. you always say it and then afterwards you're like oh shit yeah where did, where did that come from <laughs> i mean I, I sometimes get that in interviews actually like i'll come out with uh like feelings and kind of like reasons for things that have happened and then afterwards i'm like actually that's right mm. like i didn't actually i hadn't really come to terms with that how i've like felt on things but i'll say it to a camera and be like oh yeah that's how I feel. Yeah, like, you put yeah. it out in the open, yeah. Yeah, it's weird, eh, when it happens. I was going to say, because you said before, like, you were coming back for your, your big comeback. Because mm. when did this, I remember we, we saw us at each other in Portugal back in 2020. Yeah. And that was, was that the year you were going to come, because you, you were doing, like, you were doing, like, Cathro Vision mm -hmm. stuff, but you weren't racing then, were you? So. In 2019. 
because that was cathro vision or inside the tape vision. Yeah, so 2020, it was like a blend. I was still doing some cathro vision stuff, but then that was going to be the year that we were going to do, uh, was it Walk the Talk? And then I broke my neck. And then that was the COVID year that the races got delayed and happened at the end of the year. So I wasn't able to race them. And then we helped out the Zvar brothers and Jamie Edmondson got like a podium mm. and uh, we're helping out Michaela Parton as well. And we kind of made a video series about that. And then the year after was when I did a full season just by myself. Um, like still under pink bike, but we had some personal sponsors and stuff like that. Um, and then after that, uh, we decided that it was kind of risky putting a full series just on my shoulders. Did you feel more pressure like in those years from coming back into racing? Did you feel like I have to perform or the fact that you were doing so many other things, it was almost like, well, I'm not here to race. I am, but I'm also. Yeah. Well, like, yeah, there was barely any pressure because I was like, I, uh, <laughs> yeah, if anything goes wrong, <laughs> still make a video, you know, it's like the results weren't the main priority and focus. We kind of said at the start, we just want to like show how hard it is like to actually perform at that level but I also felt that with bigger bikes bigger wheels and if I got the kind of funding to be able to like spend time training and stuff that I would actually be able to do really well and I just for whatever reason I was never able to actually properly invest the time into myself to like come in as my best self like I like I don't think I've ever actually gotten myself to a place that I was like yes this is me that I could top 10 get a podium at a world cup and it's really weird because i feel like there is a version of me that could do that mm. like i i know there is a version of me that could do that but i ne i was never able to figure out how to do it do you, you think know? that comes down to want like where your want is because i know personally mm. when i've like i know i know when i've done my best mm. and been able to get podiums i know how bad i've wanted it mm. and then when i haven't done that I know within myself that like, I just didn't want it. Like I know, like I wasn't getting up at 4 a.m. and going to the gym. I wasn't riding yeah. trail bikes in the rain. I wasn't doing 10 downhill laps in my local trail. Like I didn't want it that bad. Yeah. And you get out what you put in. Yeah. And I feel like you say there is a version out there, mm. but then again, like again, it comes back to that version of yourself that is a top 10 World Cup racer, mm. might make really shit videos, mm. might not have enough time with his family. So mm. I guess it's that whole balancing act of like, he is there, but the juice isn't kind of worth the squeeze yeah. in a way. No, you're absolutely right. And that is just the matter of it. It's in every sport. The, the person that has the desire is usually the person that does it. Yeah. Did you feel like you said that you were enjoying racing more though because mm. of that? Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> that, that's, the, that's the weird thing, isn't it? Because I even know this, like I came to the first race races this year mm. and I had all this pressure on myself and I felt anxious. I remember at Lenzai, I was going up for my first run mm. and I don't know for whatever reason, but I just felt like I like wasn't ready. Yeah. And I just felt really just like unsure and anxious. And then oh. I rode really tight and it's I just, horrible. and I just rode terribly. And I was just, cause I had all this pressure that I put on myself and then I didn't even qualify. And I was like, what is going on, man? And yeah. then I crashed at Leo Gang. That was kind of just unlucky. Mm. And then carried that injury through to Val de Sol, which I did shit. And then mm. I went home and I kind of made some decisions, which I'll, everyone will know in a couple of days. Mm. But then coming back to these ones, I was just like, I just don't care. Mm. And then I rode so much better yeah. just from letting go of that idea of caring about the end result and just, I'm just going to go ride my bike yeah. and have fun. And once you do that, it's like, this is actually really fun again. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like, I, ha I haven't done as well as that guy that was probably, maybe not putting as much pressure, but still mm -hmm. pressure on themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's that idea of like, how do you become that athlete, which loves what they're doing, doesn't yeah. care about the end result, but then also has the drive to do that well. And that's the golden goose kind of thing. Dude, it's, it's such, like it, it's something we're talking about this year, like with our video series, it's just that how much of an absolute mental sport like all all like high-end sport is it's just like who has either just naturally got the brain for it or who's able to figure out how to get their mind in the right place to be able to do it because mm. it is insane like uh, i mean this year uh amy on our team she's been really struggling with her mindset like last year she came in and we're like you know what we're here to race but 
results don't really matter. You're going to learn. You're going to figure things out. And it'll just be fun, you know. And got some really good results. I almost won in snowshoe, and it was like this is amazing. The girls that were beating you are moving up into a higher category, and now, I mean, world's your oyster, eh? You're like, let's go win some World Cups. And there were some things that happened in the off season, um, in terms of injury for her that kind of messed up her prep. But we were still like, ah, it should be fine. And then this year, just a few things have like knocked her confidence, and then it's so hard to build it back up again. Mm. Like, um. I think it's different for every person, but like had a crash and then because of that crash didn't qualify. And it's like, it was probably because you were injured and sore and like weren't able to really push. But then it's like, oh, well, is it because I just wasn't going fast enough? And then the next race, just thinking about that, like, am I actually good enough? It's like, of course you are, you podium, you've almost won before. Like, oh, but I'm not riding well. It's like, yeah, you are riding well, but you're just thinking about it too much. Mm. And it's like, how do you help someone get their mind in the right place when you can't and i was thinking about it, i can't even do it for myself <laughs> like, you can see it but yeah, you can't yeah, like yeah. i can't convince myself of thinking what i'm saying yeah. but i'm trying to convince you i know it's and like it's, when you see yeah. a protected rider become unprotected in the top mm. 20 and like for example dylan levesque he's qualified like almost top 10 at every world cup he fell outside the top 10 protection yeah and then he qualified 30th or 35th or something but then in the semis he went fifth and yeah. then got sixth yeah so it's like that whole time he was fast enough yeah but because of his mindset of like i'm not protected i could crash i'm like he starts you focus on the on the negatives you focus on the doubt mm. you focus on what if what if what if mm. and then you don't focus on like in the race you're like oh well i'm i can go fast enough now so then you focus on i want to get better yeah. and you got to shift that that way of thinking to focus on the positive not the negative it's so hard isn't it it's so hard <laughs> especially when you don't qualify at one and then you like those little voices in your head yeah. start like getting louder and louder well, like i'm i'm having it right now because like i it broke my back first round i was so annoyed at that because I, I was actually feeling pretty good start of mm. this year like i'd made i was like i'm gonna get a top 10 this season Fucking watch this and then came in and uh i just rushed some a few things and then had that crash and then through the summer uh like recovering from my injury I didn't get depressed, I don't think, but I just got down on everything. I was just like, did a shit job of recovery. Like, didn't maintain things. I wanted to, like, really wanted to, but I just couldn't. I don't know. It was, it was, it was a pretty bad summer of, like, going through the recovery and even, like, things to do with work. Like, I kept putting loads of stuff off and moved house and it all was a bit much, to be honest. And then deadlines started rolling around for like, oh, I'm going to have to go back to the World Cup. So then I started training again. And then as I got back into biking, started feeling a lot better again. And uh, yeah, now I'm at the World Cups and I don't feel like I'm in the best condition. And then I'm trying to tell myself to take it easy because I'm not like strong. But if you're thinking about taking it easy, you're thinking too much, then you make more mistakes. Mm. And I did that last week, I had a crash, because I was like, trying to think to hold things back, and then I was making mistakes, and I was like, no, just stop overthinking it, just ride. And I went too fast and had a crash, and now I feel like I'm in like a vicious circle of just like, what do I do? I think the whole know? don't look at taking it easy, I just look at trying and have as much fun as possible. Like, I went to Andorra mm. and I was like, I'm just gonna do some whips, I'm going to do some lines that might not be faster, but look yeah. like fun yeah. and build into it that way and yeah. follow people as well. If you've got someone that you know that you enjoy following, just mm. follow them. And then mm. like, then you sub, like, you don't even think you just follow them mm. wherever they go. You go, you focus on that. I think that's a good way of like breaking that way of like, even like it was funny. I like grew up r like riding and helping Ollie Davis. Mm. And I was like, we never ride at world cups, man. Let's ride at Andorra. So I just followed him and we rode together. And I was like, that's what I needed to like, to get that enjoyment back to be like why did i start racing to mm. ride with my buddies to do whips to have yeah. fun like let's go back to the simple stuff and the rest will kind yeah. of fall into place uh, who stoked to you that helped ollie out oh, and see where he's got to now man. it's so sick i think yeah. that was the thing when i i once once i started realizing that i was happy of seeing like ollie and there's another kid i help at home zach bradley mm. like 
seeing them win or do well or mm. learn or grow, I'm like, I get way more ha- like fulfillment and happiness out of seeing that mm. than my own results. Like it was funny, like at Endora, like I got like 42nd or something, which is like whatever. Yeah. But then I saw Oli got like 11th and I'm like, man, like, yeah. and trying to like feed off that excitement yeah. and then to back it up again, because I think a lot of people, not like, not shocked that he's done so well now, but I think the fact that, cause he was like really fast as juniors. Mm. He got fourth in the overall and he was like right there and got podiums yeah. and stuff. So he's been quick and then he had an injury that he had to mm-hmm. deal with and then he came back and got injured again. So I think people are like, he didn't have that smooth sailing through juniors yeah. to elite. He's had to fight for it a bit, mm. but now he's like got that momentum and that, that he's just, he's, you watch him right. He doesn't even look like he's trying. Like he's just, he has that style where he's yeah. just cons- c- clean and consistent. And he even said at Andorra at the bottom, he's like, I was on a good run. So I was like, don't mess it up. And I slowed up a bit. And I was like, you're half a second off the podium. Like imagine that. And it's like, he just needs that, um, that bit of confidence. Cause yeah. one thing I've learned with helping like younger kids or just people in general is like, mm. if you can show belief in them before they have belief in themselves, mm. that will like elevate them past where they've never mm. thought they could go. And I know with him as a kid, like I remember just trying to instill that and, I think now when you see it starts to happen, like I even said to him, I was like, oh, you get a podium at Leger next week. And he's like, oh, and I'm like, yeah, why not? Mm-hmm. Like you're a couple of seconds off now. And like, you, and like, you can see that you're, you're pushing, but you're not like, mm-hmm. you're not in the ragged edge, which might make it better or worse, who knows? But yeah, I think it was always a thing that I guess when I got to, when I think anyone, you get to a certain point in any sport, it comes to a point where you're like, all right, let's give back to other people mm-hmm. and not just for them, but for me. Like I always joked about with um, with Ollie and stuff because his parents and everyone always say like, oh, thanks for helping him so much. And I was like, he helps me just as much. Mm. Like it might not look like that, but I was even at a point when I was like not that keen on riding bikes, but I had a, a kid to go riding with and he would push me and I would push him. And it was just like this, like wisdom is mixed with like youth and excitement. And yeah. it's like those two things combined and both people get elevated. So yeah, no, I've, I've, yeah, I think he's got a long way, long way yeah. to go. It's funny how, eh, like, it's just like half a second. Yeah, I go half a second quicker, but you still not believe that you could get a podium. Yeah. You know, it's like, dude, it's just, it's right there. Like, yeah, it's yeah. not far. Yeah. The, it's crazy. When I've, when I've done the best and had the best years, like, I've just believed I could. Mm. Like, that was the, the foundation to those good results was the belief in myself. Like, mm. I remember I went to, lens height i think it was in 2019 and i think we did the video when i was like inside the tape vision or something i just remember that yeah 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 i, was, I remember doing that with you when you because i was like Cat, no when i say cathro vision you're like i can't even remember it's like it's dude. inside the tape and i'm like inside the tape vision, vision. <laughs> but I you were you were always the one that would come up and have, have a chat i'd be like trying to film people and ask what they were doing and they'd be like looking at lines yeah. you'd just be like yeah yeah what are we going yeah, we're here <laughs> <laughs> I do better when I'm like that because yeah. that's I guess my uh, like authentic self if I'm like being that person I'm writing better I'm speaking better everything works better but I remember going to that race and I just I was telling people like, I'm gonna get a podium this weekend mm. like I just had this confidence that I, I couldn't help but say it for yeah. whatever reason and I, I got set I think I was like a second I got seventh and I was like a second off the podium but yeah. it was I did that well because I tr- I believed I was yeah. like 100 percent I'm gonna do that so even having the target as well having the target yeah. and believing in it it's yeah it makes a big thing mm. I know it would be nice if we could just do that and everything in life eh? <laughs> You kind of can. It's just you need the you need the hard work to back it up. Yeah, that's, that's true. the thing. Like you that's need the true. belief, but then you need the. What did someone say? It's like I think luck is when hard work meets opportunity. So it's like you got to have you got to have I both. Know. Of those you do things. have to remind yourself of that as well. It's like oh yeah, you got lucky, and it's like well, you probably did a lot of work as well. Like, yeah, you, you look at other people. You don't see all the back back yeah. end of what's happening. Yeah. Because even we were talking before about the whole mindset of wanting to do something, but then enjoying the process. And I think someone that seems to have mastered it, from like my perspective anyway, was like Jackson Goldstone. Mm-hmm. I remember chatting to him, might have been last year when he was a junior still. Mm-hmm. And he just seems so happy to mm-hmm. be riding his bike. Mm-hmm. And I saw that and I was like, I want to be that happy to be racing because I know that feeling. Yeah. And that feeling is such a refreshing and nice feeling. Like mm-hmm. It's like yeah, you want to get good results, but you were just pumped to be riding your bike down this yeah. hill. And I remember the days like with the intense guys with me, Chuck, Nick, Jack, like I just had fun going in trains with my mates. Yeah. And like that was the 
bedrock of enjoyment for World Cup racing. And then it's like one comes with the other. It's, mm. it's crazy. That, I was a heck of a team, eh? Like, yeah, that was like, cool. Yeah, yeah, I can remember, eh? Like, I think I, I like stuck my head into your pits in like Val de Sole. And I was like, kind of like a little bit unsure. I hadn't really, really talked to you guys before. I remember going and getting like interviews with you all. I think that was the year that you all started smashing it. Started coming out. Yeah. Because oh, cool. you all kind of like leveled up similar paces like jack stood out in 2017 because he mm. got second well, it was funny we both got second i got rain affected he actually did it out of, at fort william um but that that year we kind of both leveled up and then 2018 we both like all three of us had a a, a really good year yeah, yeah i think chuck didn't get a podium but he was, all, he was like in the top 20 every race i think he got a top 10 at mont saint anne or something mm. jack like we were just always mm. always there but that was that was such a cool team yeah like that was that was really like it's, it's something we've been talking about as well like uh with our team it's just about how important like the vibe is and just mm. like everyone having a good time and it's like we're trying to figure out like what comes first does it but is it bad results then ruins the vibe or does the vibe go wrong and then bad results come from that and it's like a kind of like a chicken and the egg thing because like definitely like last week uh, as a team we had a pretty bad race like none of us qualified mm. and it was like it's kind of hard to like be happy and like cheery about that kind of thing it's like right okay we'll refocus you know to next week and shit, let's go and do some other stuff and just have some fun and kind of forget about it and stuff like that and it's like it can like someone can go on a confidence roll I think you can also go on like a like a negativity role. Mm. So it's like trying to reset, forget and like yeah, find the fun. Mm. It's uh it's a really interesting thing how yeah, emotions and results are just so linked like. Mm. Yeah. And it's, it's crazy as well how I was talking to someone about this the other day and it was about how this guy was sponsoring this athlete because of who they were as a person, like their personality, their mm. energy they brought, what they did. And the athlete was like real worried that he was gonna lose his sponsor because he wasn't getting the results. So he was like closing off, like shutting off to the uh, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. the person had to said like, we don't care about results, but if you stop being who you are, yeah. we won't want to sponsor you. Yeah. So it's like, if you're yourself and the results aren't there, we mm. still want to be a part of your brand as a person. Yeah. But if you, get ne down and negative and your vibe changes and you hide away because of like you don't get the results that's why you've lost the ride and the sponsor not because mm. you're not getting the result and i think that's such a hard thing for an athlete to understand to be like and you look at for example like when i chatted to win like gt is like we don't care if you race yeah we want to sponsor win masters for who you are as a person yeah. and the excitement you bring and the interviews yeah. you do but i guess in his mind for so long he's like i have to race yeah. to do this yeah and once you realize you don't it's like oh yeah. Cool. Like, there's so much more to this. Yeah, I've not actually asked him when he's gonna hang up the SPD shoes. Yeah, like, he's not not really said. He just seems to love being at the races. I think he likes riding his bike. Yeah. 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 I was gonna ask you because you check your phone. You've got to be somewhere. No, no, no. What I did was I actually pressed the mic thing in my pocket, and I thought I turned it off. So I was just checking. Oh, I just checking to see if it's still there. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was gonna ask you with because obviously there's a lot of debate now with the new broadcasters new changes all this stuff has been going on and i think where where do you like where do you th see the things that could do with improving because i don't this is one thing i hate getting on like a negative spiral of because mm. uh, because even when people say oh we miss and that we miss this guy and i'm like it, it's changes happen mm. we've got to deal with it mm. but from your perspective where do you think is the best way to kind of fix or implement some things that could help the sport in a in a more positive way it's a lot easier to criticize <laughs> yeah like because like the the criticisms that have been happening this year i guess would be the things that main things that you try and fix so like in terms of broadcast i feel like some of the choices when it comes to like camera angles like for, for me, when I'm watching, I'm like, why, why have they put the camera there? Like who's decided to do that? Like you can barely see anything. It's a weird angle. You can't really see the track. All you know is there's a rider going that way. You don't, I don't know as a spectator, I'm not getting much from kind it. I like the shoot at Ludon VL. Yeah. Like they didn't get the corner, no. which is like the bit that you're like. I know, uh, so like, I'm not sure how they decide that. Or 
if they brought someone in with experience or if they, it is a, just a totally new team that are just figuring it out as they go along. I, I'm, not, I'm not in there. I don't talk to the people that are involved with that. Dinner's ready. <laughs> is that the alarm for the... That was just a check. Yeah, get a rough idea, but... Do you have it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, I feel like someone with experience or knowledge should just be trying to help with that because it's not great. And then the other one that really annoyed me was when they tried to use the drone when it was so windy at Andorra and the, the rider was barely in the frame. Mm. Like the drone's falling, but he's just trying to follow the track and it's windy. So like it's pointing at the, the trees and you don't, you can't actually see what the rider's doing. And yeah. I was just like, ditch it. Just You're holding on to something too tight, hey? Dude, yeah, I know. Uh, so that kind of thing really annoyed me. Um, when it comes to the commentary side of things, I think it was always going to be t tough for two new people to like really figure it out. Like so Cedric's done it in French in the past. So now he's got to figure out how to do it all in English. Uh, Rick's done some commentary before, but it was usually in post-race videos and rather than live. Um, but he did have experience doing like the pit stuff. Like, uh, like he used to be the guy in the finish yeah. area that would be like ask them questions, and which was dude, great. He was so it was good really that. good for that. So good at that, and I honestly feel like he's been getting better as this year has gone on. And it is the kind of thing that I mean, when Rob first did it, he was. It wasn't great. Mm. Like he would just shout and be drunk and entertaining, but the commentary I think got better year after year after year. And that's comparing someone that's had over 10 years doing it and honed their craft to someone that's stepping in and doing it new. I think it can be a bit of a harsh comparison, but equally so it does have to be good. You know, it's the new broadcasters. It should be, it should be really good. So yeah, I, I don't know how you do that better. I feel like Rick's going to need to keep practicing at it and keep figuring out what's good, what's bad, and how to get better at it. I think they need better technical analysis of the writing that's going on, because I think Cedric does have some interesting things. But when Aaron came in, it just made me realize that it needs someone who's really good at that to really elevate it. Because Aaron was saying things that I was like, oh, that's super interesting. So think, yeah. I can imagine people at home were like, Oh god damn. Yeah. That's some good information. So like it needs that. Um and then in terms of the organization, like we've had maybe too many new things, to be honest. They've like thrown too much stuff at the wall and not a lot of it stuck, mm. really. Um What's your opinion on the semi finals? So I didn't know to begin with. I thought it could be really cool. I thought it could be really interesting. It works in a lot of other sports, but now that it's gone on for a while, it's not great, to be honest. I think it puts too big a uh, demand on the schedule to be able to fit it in. And I think it spreads racing out over such a large portion of the day that the weather has become a bigger factor. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's been a good thing. Personally, I, I kind of like seeing it because I can, I watch the live feed. Like when I'm doing the reporting on the race, I'll watch the semis, I'll watch the race. I gather all the information. There's lots of interesting things because it's broadcast. There's like cool lines. There's interesting like crashes and things that happen. It's for me, it's really good. <laughs> like I quite like it. But as a viewer, it kind of feels like you watch the race and then you watch the race again, you know? It, it kind of waters it down a little bit. Yeah, yeah, definitely waters it down a little bit. And I think for the very few super fans, it is cool. Like it, it is it's more racing. It is yeah. more racing. It is cool, but yeah, the, I, the, I don't think it's been a success. The time, because I had like I didn't qualify very well at uh, Ludon Vio. I had less than an hour from my last practice run to my semi-finals yeah, run. That's gnarly. And. I didn't understand the pressure and like just the lack of build up. Like, you know, when you mm. do a race run, it's like you normally have that big break mm. for women to go. Like obviously practice then you've got like a bigger time to practice than the women. Like you just have a longer time between mm. that run and you can kind of go up, put your headphones on, get in the zone yeah. and do some stretching. I got to the top of the hill because obviously the bikes are super muddy. Yeah. So you gotta go wash the bike. I had muddy gear, I had to change my gear. By the time I changed my gear, had a banana, got the bike, went up. I had like 20 minutes to yeah, warm up before and it was like 
I didn't realize the, the biggest thing for me was I just couldn't get my head in the right space. I just felt like I was doing a time training run yeah. because it was so it's such a rush process yeah. that there was no like, okay, we're doing this. It was just like, all right, you're up, go. And I was like, oh. and I got to the bottom and I was like, well, I didn't go very hard. Like just the fact that I could, I wasn't psyched up enough for it. But you, like, I didn't think that was going to be the yeah. issue. I thought it would, whatever. I don't know. I, just, I hadn't experienced it yet. Yeah. But then to do it, I was like, okay, that wasn't. And then even the atmosphere at the bottom is like, mm feels like a quality run like it's not obviously the race run so everyone's not as excited which yeah. then kind of kills the mood a little bit yeah I, I would agree um and like there were a lot of good suggestions from the last race about like when uh, junior day just kind of got canned about potentially moving junior race to the semis because I mean there was precedent for it because they scrapped semis for Andorra mm. and then ran the race and actually I've really enjoyed that race like just it was like the race got to see all 60 riders which i think even then is also like quite long for like the average viewer but i loved it and it was just like that was the race those were the results sick really enjoyed it so when it was kind of suggested i was like oh, actually that is a really good suggestion but yeah it sounds like decisions were made pretty quick and it wasn't once the decision was made it was like they couldn't then go back in it because then would people be happy or would they think, oh, that's weak that they made a decision and then they flip flopped and they're mm. like, you know, I kind of felt like they, they, they were in a really difficult situation, to be honest. I, I felt like no matter what they decided, people were going to be annoyed and upset. And I wouldn't have made, well, no, actually in that situation, I don't know what decision I would have made, but from the outside looking in with hindsight, I wouldn't have made that decision. Yeah. But yeah, I, I can't imagine being that the person. I think it just seemed a bit rushed. Yeah. It's the only thing. I, I know they had bad weather forecast, mm -hmm. but to keep marshals up on the hill for maybe another hour or so mm -hmm. and say, hey, let's see if the weather does get worse or gets better, because the day was perfect. Like mm -hmm. by the time they would have raced, the track would have been manageable. Yeah. Like going yeah. up first run in the morning, it's still in the shade half of the track mm -hmm. that was really bad. So mm -hmm. it's like, that's the thing I would have said, be like, just give us a bit more time yeah. instead of just jumping on that, no, done. Yeah. Kind of, kind of. But like you say, either way, you're going to cop criticism. Mm. But it just, but this comes back, and this is my big push that I keep, I think, annoying people with and pushing, but it's just transparency and mm. communication mm -hmm. to fans, to athletes, to team managers, mm -hmm. to just the general public. And I guess that's something that you're doing a good job of, like, putting forward what's happening. Mm. And it's something that I find, like, I, I read comments, and it's like, why are we getting more information from athletes. I was reading the same comments. That, when there's like, when there's a, like there's a whole production company here yeah. to tell the story of the race mm. and then riders are giving, and I'm like, sweet, it's good for me. I get more views. I get more clickback, whatever. Like it, it, it's better, but it's like, I find it sad that I'm the one that people come to for information about downhill mm -hmm. racing or yourself mm -hmm. when there is people that are actually paid to be here to mm -hmm. produce it. Yep. Like, I think, I think, the issue is that they're paid to be here to produce it, to produce the like the main, the live feed, the the content that goes along with it, the social media stuff. It doesn't seem like there's anyone that's here that's paid to communicate how decisions are made. And I think that that's a tricky thing because it's like being able to share the inner workings of a company and business when it's new and they're still figuring things out it probably makes them feel would feel quite vulnerable like they may be if we do communicate how we come to the decision is that the wrong way to come to the decision will we then get more criticism because of that so let's just keep it all secret <laughs> figure it out ourselves and then we'll just let everyone know the decision and they're actually really good and timely at giving just like the decisions you know like it goes out on social media it goes out I've seen even like on YouTube, they'll announce what decisions are made. They'll announce like the decision, that. but they won't announce the kind of the reasoning yeah. for that decision. And I find like that's yeah. the the part where I go, okay, you've come up with this, mm. but you haven't told us why. Mm -hmm. And then as a normal person, we mm. question that. Yeah. And that's I, the... I, I agree. I yeah. agree. It, the, in, there needs to be explanation. Like we've done this because of this mm. and it's... Yeah, it would just make things so much more digestible. Even if we go, yeah, it wasn't because of that, though, was it? Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, but having some sort of 
Yeah, I agree. Transparency would be good. But I like to try and figure out maybe why they're not. And that would be my guess of why they're not, is that they're not... Super vulnerable, man. Sure. you got to put yourself... Yeah. Like, I, I suggested, and I, I think this would be a great way to do it, but it is putting yourself out there. Have a press conference. Mm. Put the powers to be at the front. Mm. Put, put, just say you had 10 riders from, like, the riders' union or whoever. Like, you selected 10 people with the team managers and few media like a small amount of people yeah. but enough that people like even if you pick the media that you want to put in there mm. so it's not and you get a microphone and you get each person gets i don't know or like a few people get time mm. to talk you elect a person from the riders union all right we have these questions you answer the questions mm. it's out there mm. it's done and then everyone can go it's like okay we did this for this okay mm. why did you do that for that and this blah 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 mm. oh because of this okay now we know and whether you like the mm -hmm. result or don't like the result, you know why. Mm -hmm. You don't have to guess. <laughs> so here's, here's another thing that I think might play into it. And I think there right now is a massive division in terms of World Cup racing in where they're trying to take it. And we all know it's they're trying to get it down to like the top 30, top 20 elite sport, copy other big sports. And then there's everyone else who knows they're going to be cut out of that. And when you're making these decisions, I feel like it's the elite, the top ones that are going to be more involved with making these decisions. And then if the process is kind of organized by them and then published, and then everyone else gets screwed, mm. I like, yeah, damn. Yeah, I do know <laughs> what you mean, because I had yeah. a conversation with a top rider the other day and like the whole thing when I said is downhill dead kind of thing yeah. and I told him I was like if I wanted to race next year I didn't have a pro team I, I couldn't mm. so to me downhill is dead because I can't actually compete in World Cup downhill yeah. and to him he couldn't even see that because that's so far away from where he is sat right now that mm. the idea of not racing due to a rule change mm. and due to a bad season is not even on the cards mm -hmm. so it's like if you are not look, if you like your perspective needs to shift and it's like, but then at the same time, it's like, why would someone in the top 10 care about the guy in 40th? But then the guy in 40th, a couple of years ago, could be Andreas Code, could be Benoit Coulange, could be Ronan Dunn, yeah. could be these guys that needed to have those footsteps mm -hmm. to get there. But it's like, once you get there, you don't normally look back. Yeah. You look forward. And that's the disconnect from top riders to up and coming. And that is why it's such an interesting sport and why it's like such a desirable sport for like all these like Warren Brothers and Discoveries to come into. And then, yeah, they are at the risk of taking away that kind of like variability, like a new like person comes in and they come in and they get an amazing result and everyone's stoked. They're like, it's so cool to see someone like stepping up like that. Yeah, you'd absolutely lose that. And cause like these characters that would come up, like Ronan, I think is gonna have a pretty big future in the sport. Like. Dude is an absolute specimen. <laughs> like what a character. And he seems to be able to like be pretty consistent as well. Like, well, he's getting there anyway. Mm. He's figuring it out. And yeah, it's such a shame because how many people have kind of come up like that and then how many of them wouldn't if we do go to that future? It's mm. yeah, it's a bit of a we don't know. We'll never know. But yeah, is downhill dead, Dean? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, he said it's not dead, but we might be, I know, we might I be in the ICU. We, <laughs> we need, I was, might go around with like you know the defibrillators next race and be like <laughs> interview interview people with them and see what they reckon. We're gonna try to revive it. I'm reviving it, yeah. But dude, I like the thing is though, is like I cop shit for doing that. But yeah. it's like, I love downhill. It's given me a mm. life. It's given me a career. It's made me travel around the world. Like I don't want it to be dead. There's no part of me that wants to be uh, to be dead. But well, when yeah. things keep happening, which in my eyes are killing it, mm. I want to bring attention to that. It's killing the version of it that we've grown up with and love. Yeah. And that's yeah. No one wants to see something that they are so interconnected with change in a way that would. I mean they wouldn't have been able to do that in the first mm. place well just taking my opportunity from kids that like i look mm. at myself as like when i came up it took me it was i was a slow burn to do really yeah. well and 
the new format would not allow me to have done what I have done. Yeah. And that's the thing I'm like. Yeah, everything, everything else needs to change along with it to allow people to still come up. Like they, every, they talk about like a feeder series and everything that would lead into it, but. but w- yeah. I, I, Where? <laughs> on, on, honestly, I, I don't see a feeder series developing until they it's make the big it. change and then, then it'll develop and it'll be horrible mm-hmm. and it'll be crap. I know, that's yeah. the way I think it's going to happen. Yeah. Like, yeah. Unle- unless, like, the, the people that run the World Cup make one. But, I mean, they're kind of trying to figure out how to just do, do this just one. the World Cup at yeah. the moment. So, like, yeah. <sighs> so. I end on a high. Why don't? We? <laughs> no, I do know what you mean. Like, if there's, if there's, if they don't cut it, people are going to keep coming to World Cup. So until they do mm. cut it, there's like, well, why do we go to a feeder series well, when there's a World Cup still here? So it's like you kind of. I'm not saying you should cut it, but that's yeah. what's going to create. Well, the, I feel the big cuts already happened. You know, like with Brayton and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, that's what you're the the points thing because it's going to now go from. Because top 60 get, would get points to allow them to race next year. And mm. now it's gone to top 30. Yeah. And that's going to make a big difference to, annoyingly, it's going to affect, well, it's annoying, but it also could be good, but it's going to affect the main racing nations yeah. more than any, because we don't get points racing in the UK. Yeah. No, we would be able to get any either. Yeah, yeah. So, like, the only place I've gotten points is at World Cups. Yeah. And, and now it's get them. so hard to get well, them. Well, you can, but yeah. Top 30. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So like, I feel like it's, yeah, it's already in motion. But, um, like, the World Cups are still sick. There's still like really interesting characters and everything at them. But yeah, it's changing. It is changing. It's gonna mm. be interesting to actually, yeah, look back and see, mm. like in hindsight. I, it, I hope we look back and be like, yeah, that was rough, but But it turned out being a lot better mm. than we first thought. Cause that is like, I know people and especially mountain bikers mm. hate change no matter what it is and that was one thing i try to come into this season with like like i said i said openly that i was like no matter who commentates no matter who it is mm. they're going to cop shit oh 100%. no matter how good of a job they did <laughs> they're going to cop shit like they're feeling big boots yeah. so i'm like i don't want to get too loud i don't want to get too like i'm like give them a chance give it all a chance really yeah. but then it's like i think the thing is now it's like okay we have tried some stuff mm. you're getting a response mm now what are you going to do and mm. that's the thing like next year is going to be i think that's the will there be change for the better will there mm. be nothing will what will happen and that's the kind of yeah. the determining factor i think i think these sh- huge companies and productions they're not nimble i i feel like mid-season changes are we're always going to be like um not much was going to happen but i've been hearing chat from a few people about plans for next year and it is like yeah big big changes based on the feedback that they've gotten mm. i mean you'd be stupid not to like you have to if they don't like have you crap. read any of the comments on discovery or like um eso or anything like that like uh, like specifically where are we just any any Anywhere, any yeah. post at the moment is pretty yeah. much all i see is get rid of semi-finals <laughs> like like you can't when every single comment says that you go well Maybe we should change yeah. it. Like I just well, I see. I'm also of of the belief though that things that are popular online are easy to kind of get behind. So if like a few people say like, "Oh yo, scrap semifinals," mm. other people then go, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. scrap semifinals for one of having their own kind of or for lack of having their own kind of idea of how to fix it." Yeah, but. I do also agree with that. I raced the semi-finals and then I still felt the race went too long. <laughs> like, I'm just going to put it out there. I raced, went back, got changed, ate food, came back and watched the rest of the race. I'm like, my legs are sore. I don't want to stand up yeah. any longer. So like <laughs> for that, I look at that and it's just like, because it is, it's a long well, dude, amount of time. I've been trying to be savage with my viewpoints uh, when I'm trying to like formulate thoughts on it all. But like as a pure viewer, like watching a race, I think I would enjoy just like a super small, like top 10 women, top 20 men. Mm. I think that would look really good. Mm. And it would be in a narrow window, less chance of weather affecting it. Um, And they could really show all the runs, make an amazing production around it. I think that'd be sick, Mm. but I don't want it to happen. Yeah, (laughs) I agree. I agree with you there. Yeah. yeah. But it's then how do you have that 
with also the riders that can cut up and comers into it. Well, that's it. It's two conflicting things. You can't have both. It's not possible. Could you almost run like you know juniors a separate day? Like um, run you know juniors a race mm -hmm. a day early. Mm -hmm. Like that's the feeder series is run with the juniors, and you have like your your feeder series is your B athletes, yeah. which are. 30 or, or 40 to whatever yeah. and they race on a completely different day is that same like track mo motocross supercross do they do that I don't that? know if that is supercross I know like um, I don't know if like F3 or like F1 F2 F3 or whatever yeah. or like Moto3 and stuff they might do that separate days yeah. but that's like same track same everything mm. but you're not race. It's you're separate to the this is the big guys this is what you can break into if you get good results like just talking without really going into it in any detail, that sounds good. <laughs> like, but then you can have a separate podium, people get their yeah. shine, people get whatever, yeah. there's still, all the infrastructure is there, the mm. teams are there, mm -hmm. but you just ride in downhill two, and not downhill one. Downhill one you break on two, and that's on the su Saturday or Sunday, whenever, mm. and that's got your small window, your small finals, all that, mm. day before, you run it all kind of similar, but mm -hmm. it's just the second half. I don't know, I just thought of that as a fly. <laughs> Like, are you sure you didn't prepare that beforehand? No, that's, just, that that's, just, that's just <laughs> chatting shit in the field and apparently it sounds all right. But I don't know. I just feel like it's hard. You have a feeder series, but then like how yeah. many top brands are going to want to put, like they're not going to want to take trucks to the feeder series. They're not going to put all this effort and money into a feeder series. Like it's just going to be hard to I justify the money. I think they will. Like, cause, like think how, many, how much money in brands there are um, for back in like sponsoring athletes and sponsoring sports when the main kind of elite World Cup, if it, if it does shrink down, there's not as many opportunities for sponsorship. So they'll go, well, what else can we do? And then they will sponsor, mm. like um, like feeder series and things like this. Because that'll be also like where they get their athletes to come up into the elite team. So even sponsors that are sponsoring the, the World Cups would also sponsor the feeder series and that's where they get their, their next riders and things. So I, I, think, I think it would work. I mean, it does work in other sports. Mm. Um, but I quite like I quite like your idea to be honest. I was like, that's sick. I do, uh, I'd be keen for that shit. Yeah, and then when you're done your race, you can go and watch. Yeah, watch the, the big event. guys. Yeah, let's go. Cool. Okay, know. I don't know options. Chris, we've yeah, give Dean a call. Hey, I'm going on the DMs, man. If he replies, we can we can chat. We can make <laughs> we can work things out. All right. Well, I'll let you go. Um, anything you want to say before you you shoot off as? Um. Oh yeah, what'd you do? R kind of ruthless self-promotion at the end. Oh, if you want, actually, I actually no, I've got three questions to ask that I didn't ask. Oh. These are three, just three quick ones, so we can mm. rush through them. But first thing, if you go back in your life at any point mm. and change something moving forward, what would it be? So it's something I discovered recently. Um, like when I broke my back this year, discovered that apparently I broke my back <laughs> when I was younger, and the only thing I can think of was in school, I did gymnastics. And I tried to do a front flip onto a mat and missed the mat and just landed, sat down, and I had a sore back for a long time. And one of my vertebrae is like, there's a big bit missing out of it. So I wish I'd gone to the hospital and found that out, because I have a lot of lower back problems. Well, you know why, Lee. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I just never knew. We got the, got the x-ray when I broke my back, and they're like, oh yes, and you've broken your back. And I'm like, oh, I can see that. Holy crap. And they're like, no, no, not that one. That's an old one. It's like, and then like, <laughs> what? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so anyway, yeah, go to the hospital. True, I had that with a wrist, they x-rayed and like, oh, this bone's broken, also your skateboard's in half, and I'm like, yeah. ah, yeah. okay. <laughs> it's nice to know. Um, next one, um, what are you scared of? Ooh. Interesting, I'm not good with heights, but I feel like that's a kind of easy one. What am I scared of? I think this is like a deep one. I'm not being liked. I think I, my whole being and personality is based around that and I don't like that I'm like that but I, that I am like that I hate the thought of someone being annoyed with me or upset with me or something like that and yeah that's what I'm scared of yeah I know, I know the feeling hey yeah. but then it can also be controlling because then you try to make everyone like you yes and it doesn't people don't have to either no nope. and like so, yeah you don't have to and it's can actually be detrimental to relationships and stuff as mm. well because you try and force things yeah and a yeah. lot of time it's on them it's like mm. you need to figure out something yourself and that's mm. all good but mm. then you can just leave it yeah it's like accepting that that they don't have to mm. and they need to work something out mm -hmm. it's, yeah it's all good uh the last one how do you want to be remembered mm.
can be remembered in so many different ways, but like if I was to go quite general, is hmm. I don't know, like I don't want to go too narrow. Bonjour. Like, no. I know, but are you with me? With Patrice. I'm with Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. It's like we're using our garden when we shouldn't be. Yeah. Um, I want to be remembered. There's too many things, man. How, how can I what pick is some, What is some of You don't have to be one thing. It'd be a few things. <sighs> so at the moment, like with kids and stuff, I want to... I'd love them to remember me as like being a good father. And it's something that I, I stress about because like I will sometimes be short with them or sometimes like get frustrated when I'm trying to teach something and they're maybe not getting it. And I'm just like, I don't, I, I don't want to be like that. I want to be the kind of person or father that like, when they grow up, they can remember back all the things that were taught and how kind of kind and thoughtful and stuff I was towards them. Like, I want to be like that. So that would be like, specifically family, I'd like to be remembered that way. Um, and then in terms of like, work and professionalism, I want to be remembered as the person that made some of the best kind of insightful videos to do with skills and World Cup coverage. Like, I feel like I, can make some of the best stuff going and i'd love for that to be a legacy within this part of my life and, and work yeah that was a good one it was really mm. good i like that cool and then the last one because i'll get you to ask one after this but a last guest asked if you could have any job in the world what do you reckon it would be interesting i really struggle with expansive questions <laughs> Just like what? <laughs> so it's like just like a carny. <laughs> um, any job in the world. You could do anything you wanted. I like making things. Like I feel like I would really enjoy like woodwork or metal work. Mm. Like if I had my own shop, and I could just make stuff. Like a sculptor or like yeah. create. Yeah. Well, I, not so much like a sculptor, like. Because I think of like a sculptor, like an artist who's like trying to make beautiful things. Like I feel like I would be like the precision, like trying to make things that just everything slots together, like yeah, super yeah. nice, it's like real, like, like, real satisfying, just yeah, like clicks in, yeah, 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 yeah. I get, I get what you're like that from. kind of stuff. Yeah, I'll go with that. Yeah, yeah. That. Nice. Well, that's all. That's me done. But yeah, Thanks. Catherine Vision, thank you for coming on to the oh, Australian pleasure, experience, thank sharing you. your thoughts. Really enjoyed it. It was good. Cool. Got to yeah. some uh, some good points. Appreciate we, it. We fixed downhill racing. <laughs> We can throw some ideas for it. We complained a lot, but yeah. <laughs> no, we didn't complain too much. It was good. That's uh, cool. And then I'll I'll go. Uh, yeah, stay tuned for Pink Bike Racing documentary series end of the year. I like it. Like I'm I'm think that's what we need. We need more storytelling yeah. in this sport. There's a lot of good characters, and I think yeah, they need something like a light shone on those characters. So yeah, I think it's a good thing. Excellent. Right. Awesome. Thanks, Thank you, Mr. Cathro. We're doing.